This compact portable plus sits around since quite a while now. And while it generally works and seems to boot fine from both the floppy and the hard drive, it exposes some issues with the keyboard. And then there's this display control knob missing. So while I'm trying to fix all of this, let's also explore some 3D printing in today's episode of The Vintage Collector. Retro computing is the use of all the computer hardware and software in modern times. I'm the Vintage Collector and these are my stories. This episode is sponsored by PCBWay.com, your source for CNC machining, 3D printing, PCBs and more. Compaq was founded in 1982 and debuted with the first product, the Compaq Portable, in March 1983. What distinguished Compaq from other brands at the time was the fact that they didn't just rip off the IBM PC's BIOS, but invested a staggering 1 million US dollars for a clean room implementation by means of reverse engineering. And so, while this machine here is not the original Compaq portable, it is as close as it gets. The Portable Plus was released later in 1983 and differed only by trading in one of the 360 kilobyte floppy drives by a 10 megabyte hard drive, but otherwise featuring the same 8088 CPU along with some 128 kilobytes of RAM. So, as always, I'm powering it up to see if it still boots. I'm glad to see it still goes with the boot floppy, though I already realized that somehow the enter key is not working as I can't get past the date and time prompts. As this machine also has a hard drive, let's see if that boots as well. Look at this, it still boots, and concluding by the prompts, this machine was belonged to someone by the name of Simon and was used for playing games. But here as well, no reaction on the enter key, although most, but not all, of the other keys seem to work. As I read before, this seems to be a very common problem about the portable's keyboard and we'll see soon why. But first, I have to crack that thing open as I want to glimpse inside. There's some notches on the upper side of the case, just near to the carrying handle. I'm gently pushing in these opening tools and eventually squeezing in some screwdrivers to not have the plastic spring back. Be gentle, not to bend or stretch it too much and then it will finally let go. The first thing I see is this loose rail, which obviously belongs to one of the expansion slots. So I'll open the top cover to throw a look inside. Not much to see, the usual IO and disk controller boards and the graphics card. All in full depth, as it was usual back then. Now for that rail, I noticed that the retainer clips fall off. I'll be adding some power glue, so I can put it back to where it belongs. I'm opening the case also from the bottom side. My intention is to check out if I can easily disconnect the keyboard for the repair. But first I notice this sticker which obviously denotes the original configuration of this machine, it being a one floppy machine with 250 kilobytes of RAM. Well, no mention about the hard drive though. Anyways, let's see if I can remove that lid here, behind which sits the keyboard cable. But look, it's a non-standard connector and there's also some zip tie. Removing that will be very fiddly to reassemble, so I'll just leave it for now. Maybe I can do the keyboard maintenance even in connected state. You're really hoping for the best again, are you? Yeah, but stop disturbing me if you have nothing valuable to add, okay? Let's rather look at the keyboard, which also has this sticker attached to it. It belonged to the framework software package by Ash and Tate, which I actually have as well. Though I feel these stickers are useless and mostly disgusting, so I'm removing it using a heat gun. There's still some leftovers of glue on the surface, but I'll care for that later. Opening the keyboard is easy, it's just a bunch of screws to remove. I had previously fixed an IBM keyboard, which was a terrible nightmare to disassemble and reassemble, and I do hope I'm not experiencing the same here. 
Ha! That's what you believe. High hopes. We'll see. At least the keyboard innards are only mounted using two screws, so that's promising already. Oh wow, I just noticed that the keyboard cable is just plugged and not soldered. And it is still in good shape as well. That plug is not easy to remove by hand as it sits very tight. But some pliers can help here. Alright, to me this looks like I can just remove the PCB. And a gazillion of screws later, both the PCB and the key mechanics are separated. The PCB just looks nice and in a very good shape. There are some spots which seem to have some dirt on it, but it's definitely not corrosion and easy to remove using alcohol. And now for the key mechanism, which, as I had read elsewhere before, in fact has these little foam pads which close the contact pad on the PCB when pressed down. Oh my, how this Disgusting. It deteriorates right away at the moment I touch it. Gosh, this is really disgusting. See, I told you there's a surprise inside. Yeah, it's not the same but a similar kind of disgust as I experienced on that IBM Model F keyboard. Oh, how I hate things like this. Of course, I had done my preparation work up front, so this was not totally unexpected. There's some videos online already showing how you could remake these foam pads yourself using the proper materials. But I did something similar already on the IBM Model F keyboard and literally felt no enjoyment about it. So I was just lazily buying some pads from some guy on eBay. Now it is as important still to separate the foam pads or what is left of them from these tiny clear plastic discs. It's 83 in total and you definitely need to keep them as you need to glue them back to the new foam pads. It's a good idea to clean them a bit. It doesn't have to be perfect but removing the old foam leftovers as good as possible is still a necessity. Then eventually the even more tedious work begins, namely to glue those discs onto the foam pads. And this is where I made a fatal mistake. So at first I used this fluid glue which seemed to work fine at the beginning. I just did a few and thankfully then stopped because it was late at night. On the next day I did notice the keys not working fine anymore and giving quite some pressing resistance. Upon closer inspection I then realized that the foam pads obviously soaked the glue and blew up. That was clearly not my intention. Oh my, you had one job to do. How hard can it be? Yeah, of course, you knew better, as always. So I did another one using a more gel-like power glue. Then I let it stay and dry and thankfully it wouldn't expose the same behavior. So lessons learned, don't rush things when working with glue. I then continued to do the other foam pads using this revised method. My biggest fear eventually became true as I didn't have enough spare pads to cover up for my mistake. In the end I was having just four for which I didn't have a spare so I had to make the best out of it. I ended up cutting away the small plastic disc and trying to sculpt the foam pad back into more or less its original shape and then re-gluing the plastic disc using the other power glue. You were sort of safe by the bell, one might say. Not yet, as when powering up, I'd get this weird error message not seen before. And even with the system eventually booting up, I had a hard time pressing some keys. The bottom key row felt especially hard and resistive. But also, some keys would simply not react at all or behave erratic. And even sometimes, without my intervention, random key presses would appear on screen. So I started taking notes, documenting the non-working keys and, well, disassembling the keyboard once again. As it turned out, the foam pads were not precise enough, sometimes making undesired contact, other times not at all. Eventually, I swapped some of them out into different positions, coming into a more and more working condition step by step. In some cases, I even cut away some material again, but ultimately, I didn't want to redo all the pads, hence I tried another approach. So I added some 1mm plastic washers into some areas to compensate for the uneven height of the foam pads. And guess what? This made the biggest difference of them all. 
giving the additional breathing air was mostly what was needed because the foam pads are still thick enough to make contact to the PCB when pressed down. And ultimately the error went away as you can see here and I had a finally working keyboard again. And see here this gel that sits on top of the keyboard frame. That's glue solvent that I applied to get rid of the glue leftovers from that overlay that we saw earlier. Now I can simply rub it away and go over it with some alcohol for the finishing touch. Reassembling the case is then quite easy as it's basically just sliding the big trim panels back into position until they snap. The only thing really worth mentioning is this little bit that I previously missed. See the printing here which denotes the case was being manufactured on December 1 1984. Although this doesn't tell us anything about when the machine was actually assembled it still gives a rough idea about the potential timeline. Now with the keyboard repaired the enter key working again I was able to run some commands like here Norton system information. Finally the system reveals its full specs being an 8088 with a CGA display and more important to know having a full stack of 640 kilobytes of RAM. Now this machine originally came with 256 kilobytes of RAM so the RAM was maxed out at some point in time. It's really really nice to have a fully loaded machine here but I still have to care for this missing knob here. And this is where it can become very frustrating. The older these machines are the unlikelier it is you find any such component like knobs or trim panels as standalone items. And while you may be able to glue broken plastics back together Finding a true OEM replacement can be near to impossible unless you have a done a device. But 3D printing is to the rescue and I started looking around on thingy worse. And luckily someone had in fact posted a 3D model of exactly this knob I was looking for. In the past I had my brother-in-law occasionally print me some parts for earlier restorations which for the most came from shared models from thingy worse. Admittedly I haven't too much of an experience on 3D printing so far. Eventually a friend loaned me his old 3D printer so I could familiarize myself into the topic. And coincidentally at just about the same time I got contacted by PCBWay if I had any interest on a collaboration essentially furnishing me parts for free in exchange for sharing my experience on this behalf. PCB Way, situated in Shenzhen, China, offers a variety of services suitable for both large-scale projects but also one-off projects like mine. Services range from many options around the design, production and full assembly of PCBs, CNC machining, injection molding and 3D printing. PCB Way also hosts a huge community where anyone can share their projects. And if your shared project is picked up by someone else, you get a kickback of 10% of the production cost. When joining PCB Way first time, you'll benefit from a one-time $5 welcome voucher. For example, if you choose this special 10 for 5 PCB production run, you'd get your first batch of 10 PCBs literally for free. For me, really going for an online service was a first timer. But the starting point is easy at first when you upload your STL file. The UI features a 3D view where you can review again the model. And with all the different material options you can select from, you get the estimated price updated in real time. Don't worry if you, like me, have no idea what all these materials and their characteristics are as there's detailed descriptions available for everything. As being rather unexperienced in this topic, I ultimately chose ABS. However, as it turned out, my choice of a material was wrong and so I got contacted by Darcy recommending me to switch to nylon instead. Now, with me asking back, it eventually ended in a short discussion about the material stability where I decided to proceed with the nylon for the time. The story could end here, though soon I'd get contacted by Darcy again as it turned out those cutouts on the top of the knob causing quality issues. So I was asked to revise the SDL file which I first tried to do on thinkacat.com. 
Now bear with me, as mentioned, I'm not a CAD expert and this is where I took my head start, only to find I couldn't break down the rendered file to make the necessary changes. So there was ultimately no way around for me but to dive into FreeCAD and open the original FreeCAD file provided from Thingiverse. As I had no idea, I had to read some tutorials on how to use it properly so I could make the adjustments on this top structure. Eventually I did two additional revisions, one with increased wall depth and another one leaving the cutouts away in their entirety. So ultimately I then got into this delivery from PCB way and you can guess by the box size there's more parts inside than the ones that I'm showing today. But for the knob I was surprised to also find the misprints. So the four on the bottom left were the revised prints which more or less went wrong as they exposed this huge dispersion on the edges. The one on the bottom right came from the revision 2 file and really looks nice. Then on the top you see the revision 3 file outcome where I literally took away the cutout structure in its entirety. One might now blame PCB way on the mediocre output for most of the attempts, though in my opinion that would be totally unfair. If we are comparing this to the photo on the Thingiverse, we can also see the dispersion with the top level structure fading away. And here is how it actually should look like. Maybe investing a bit more time on my behalf could have vastly improved the result. Plus, I may add, as I did a production run on several different parts, which we'll see in a follow-up episode, I think that for this part, resin instead of nylon actually would have been the better choice of a material. So going by the original images, I can't just leave this in its white color, can I? No. So I have this plastics activate to hear that I'm... Just do me the favor and use one of the misprints first, will ya? Sure, sure, sure. I'm doing test run on this misprint where I'm applying the activator first. I let it dry for 30 minutes before applying the black spray paint. As you can see, this is a matte paint, though it overall looks quite okay. So I decided to eventually go forward with my preferred knob as well. I would then apply a clear coating, which hopefully will protect the paint. But wait, isn't there something to be done about those cutouts? Wait yourself and see. I'll be trying to fill in this delicate structure with some white paint. I decidedly applied the clear coat beforehand in the hopes that I could rub any excess away if it wouldn't work out. But apparently this idea plays out very nicely. And this looks just great once installed. And this concludes my look into the Compact Portable Plus. I was rather lucky with this one as others had experienced definitely more complications with any such machine. According to the pre-owner, which was still the original owner of this machine, he had it all restored in a dry location and was very careful about it. True story. And just having some deteriorated keyboard foam pads and a missing knob was not too bad a deal. Yeah, although I think you sold the episode too cheaply to your sponsor, you just got a rather simple knob. Rather a bunch of them. But I'm producing two episodes back to back and the next one up will feature some more heavy lifting on the 3D printed parts when we are going to look into the Compact Portable 3's restoration. Either way, I still want to revisit this machine and check out if it could run actually Microsoft Xenix. Microsoft? Xenix? What the? Yeah, Microsoft's long lost, almost forgotten Unix operating system from the early 80s. But that's another story for yet another time. I'm the Vintage Collector and this was my story for today. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Next time on the Vintage Collector. The hard drive has a breakdown and this now that I wanted to look into Xenix. If you check out this channel's community tab, you'll find some polls on potential upcoming videos. You're very welcome to upvote on upcoming topics or drop in new ones you'd like me to chase down.